You 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 get you get take your Rowan Atkins and scene and you get go to hell, man. I hope you're joking. <laughs> I have no freaking idea why we are looking at this film tonight. Welcome to the flick clap, by the way. <laughs> it's not a Bond film, just so you know. It, it, it is. It is a Carter Bond film. It's not. It, it, it is. It it's is. Not. It is. It, it has James Bond. By name. It, it has a Bond storyline. That's about it. Literally, because it's been lifted from t- Thunderball. Paul. It, it it has James Bond himself on the script writing duty. Like, the on- only thing missing is a fat, greedy, and lazy producer. What are you talking about? We have it, Henrik. Well, well, yeah, we do, but but it's it's the other fat, lazy, greedy producer this time. Instead, we have an incompetent one. But yeah, yeah, welcome to the Freak Lab. If, if you are just joining us on the Bond Marathon, or if, if you have been with us for quite some time listening to the Bond episodes and you are still thinking what the fuck is going on, the the gimmick was that we are going to go through each Bond actor and look one good and one not good film from from each actor. And we started this one with Sean Connery and from Russia with Love, advanced from there to George Lazenby, then check out Roger Moore. Much more. And... Today we are dealing with Sean Connery and Never Say Never Again, because that's how logic works. And we have a Tom. His name is Guest. Hello. Hello. Yep. A wild Tom. Cat. Thank God we have Tom. I, I, I don't know why, why the madman mad is still act, agreeing to show up on these episodes, but <laughs> we are still happy to have you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you. That's what they all say at first. And I'll give you whatever I know about this. I'm supposed to be the expert, but... You are. So we shouldn't be really even covering this film. Okay, I'll give you my expert opinion. We, we most definitely should be covering this film. Okay, most... if you're listening to this podcast, don't waste your time. Just do not watch the film. Yeah. Because it's such a terrible film. Straight from the Bond expert's mouth, Henrik. Switch off. There's, the this is not a Bond there, film. There, there is, there is good, good things in it. Yes. In this one, How many bad. They may be far and few between. Uh-huh, they may uh-huh. be small yep. and quickly passed. Mm-hmm. But there is a couple of good things. I don't really consider this a Bond film myself for several reasons. Connery is back, yeah, but they take so many different routes here, and uh, the glamour is gone. At least it's nowhere near the amount of glamour that you have in the Eon Productions series. It is kinda like I- 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 in a in a way you have that Doctor No level of glamour here. Like Bond goes to a foreign country and there is scenes happening in that country. I mean, yeah. which which casino has arcade machines? I mean, come on, it's just it's just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you you had me there. I uh... I think even just some of the locations look kind of dirty and unpolished, and so does kind of the rest of the film and the cast, to be perfectly honest. Or it just might be that I don't like some of the actors in their roles. But okay. But let's talk a little bit about uh, Kevin McClory. This is the troublemaker for the Eon Productions series, who is the producer of the film. It's purely and simply his ego trip in the making. Thunderball 20 years later, just to get a jab at Eon Productions. Or just a trip to try to do a better Bond film than Octopussy, which he didn't do. No, 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 no. This is a passion project, obviously. Yes, it is. Like you can deduct from the, what, what, a decade worth of legal battles that went behind the scenes before the film was made. 
Yeah, but this guy is totally nuts. I mean, this movie was on the drawing boards for 20 years. So when Thunderball was made in 65, where Kevin McClory was the sole producer, they made a deal with him, this co-writer of Thunderball, the book with Ian Fleming, that he would not be able to do another Bond film by himself for the next 10 years. So the 10 years came and went, and in 75, Kevin McClory and Sean Connery little by little started to plot their own Thunderball film. A film indeed that would be made outside of the so-called Eon Productions official series. And the title of Never Say Never Again is a reference to a 1971 Sean Connery moment where he declared that he would never again return for the role of Bond. Kind of funny in the sense that this uh, definitely carries on from the 1971's Diamonds Are Forever spirit in its humor. Perhaps not, not in its scale, which was one of the problems for Connery in the Eon production series. And in fact, the Eon production series writer Tom Mankiewicz, which was requested to join aboard and write this film, but due to his loyalty for the Eon franchise, he turned it down. Budget was 36 million, gained 160 million in the box office. Not bad. So kind of surprising that uh, this movie never got a sequel. But the reason could be, of course, that the crew might have been kind of reduced to the Thunderbolt stories due to some agreements. There were some rumblings that the Eon guys said, no, 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 you have to limit yourself even further into the Thunderbolt story, so there might be that. So this was only a little bit less successful than the Eon Productions movie of the same year, Octopussy, in 1983, which was a budget of 27.5 million and returned home 187 million. So yeah, this was uh, kind of a battle of the bonds. Sean Connery and Roger Moore were actually able to meet up during the filming of their respective films because they were shooting at the same time. Sean Connery also said to Roger Moore that the media is going to play it like this, that they're going to kind of juxtapose each other, put us as the rivals, but told him to not read too much into it. But the fact remains, it's uh, Bond against Bond. Whichever way you're going to put it, this is uh, Sean Connery's James Bond challenging the Bond of Roger Moore. Of course, there's an extremely long history behind this entire film, but to give it in a nutshell, there was this certain Ian Fleming, the writer of the Bond books, and Kevin McClory, who were working on a Bond screenplay, but that was scrapped somewhere along the way. But Ian Fleming had the brightest idea that maybe I should use this wonderful material after all in my own James Bond book, and Fleming did that. And in a no surprise to anyone, Ian Fleming was uh, facing a lawsuit from Kevin McClory. And due to his involvement in the film from 1965 Thunderball for Ian Productions, he was able to make it so that he was the sole producer for that film. And now we're simply here, so Kevin McClory and his uh, endless obsession with James Bond and Thunderball. The obsession that he took all the way to his grave, actually. And it was only after his death that the Eon Productions producers were finally able to get to use Ernst Stavr Blofeld, the name, for the leader of the Spectre organization, as well as the name Spectre, as we can see from the Bond film from 2015. As a kid, it was kind of a bummer that the Spectre organization just disappeared in the middle of the franchise. Thank you, Kevin McClory, for trying to ruin my childhood. Ah, so... Ah, come on, Spectre was not that important to Bond franchise in the end. Basically, Spectre was, was and even today still is just a faceless background organization which has Blofeld who does more or less jack shit in each film and mostly just is the source for lesser bad guys and lesser henchmen of the franchise to do evil things. Well, he kind of did something you all, you only live twice. And he played quite a prominent role in that one. Yeah, and he kind of did something in the latest one, Spectre. Yeah. Where he... No, no, oh, no. Re, re, in Redcon, he came in and made the entire Daniel Craig era. No, 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 no. Spectre and Blofeld used to be the most interesting organization and the villain against James Bond in the old days. Ah, fuck what? Yes, fuck it, it was. was. Yes, it was. No, it was. It was f- fucking Blofeld himself. E- even in the Eon production days, he could, if he Im- even bothered to show up 
in any given film. Like there is there is what like three Bond films with Blofeld in it where Blofeld actually is a major figure. Like some someone that Bond really have to face off against and not just some guy who has money and throws it on to the, this crazy scheme. Yeah, it developed very organically. First you see Blofeld's cat, later you start to see the face of Blofeld. It was menacing and it was interesting and it was progressing and it would have continued marvelously to the Roger Moore era, but unfortunately they couldn't do that. But what what you kind of are giving out, out there in your assessment of, of Blofeld is you actually never see Blofeld to himself alone do anything in, in Bond films. Well, that's not the important part. The organization not, is not the interesting. Not in counting, not in counting on Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is the only one where Blofeld really is extremely strong character on his own right in the story and act- actually does some proper stuff in the film. Yeah, and... Well, do your bosses do any work either? Well, technically, no. I, I, I give you that much. But if I would ever actually make a film myself, I wouldn't make it out of my boss. Yeah, true. Richard Burton was considered for the role of James Bond in 64. This is when McClory started to plot his own James Bond film, which was in the early days, I believe in the 70s, and known as Warhead. Orson Welles was plotted as the next Blofeld, but didn't happen. Trevor Howard was considered as the next M and Richard Attenborough to direct. Peter Hunt was also asked to direct, but uh, due to his loyalty to the Eon franchise, so he was the director of On Her Majesty's Secret Service, he turned it down. I really killed the conversation back then. I just took... <laughs> I just, put, I just put a you, big you, fat you, rock in the floor of the conversation. <laughs> yeah. you, you made the notion of bosses and work, and, and the discussion just died. It was all good <laughs> silence, and then it was Curry extremely ham-fistedly trying to move on to the next subject. And that is what Henrik was requesting for this episode, that we keep the ball rolling in this podcast. As mentioned, Connery was deeply involved in the screenplay and the whole project, uh, but for the longest time he was not interested in playing James Bond. Finally, producer Jack Schwartzman requested Sean Connery to play James Bond once again, and he said yes. He negotiated for himself a $3 million deal, and including casting and script approval and percentage of profits. Yeah, apparently it was Connery's wife who made the notion that since Connery liked so much about the script he was himself working on, that then the Connery's wife made the notion that Connery himself should also take part in playing Bond once again. Yeah, that's... That's at least one version of how it went. Yeah, there's at least three versions of this story. There's the story where Irving Kirshner was the one that made Connery return. Then there's the story of Jack Schwartzman, the producer, making Connery return. And as you have pointed out, Then there is Connery's own version in an interview where he says that his wife made him return. There there, there also is a Connery interview where he's been asked this question. Why why did you return to play Bond in Never Say Never Again? And Connery's answer is simply name drop a bunch of people who were involved in the production and skip the question in that way. Connery suggested Klaus Maria Brandauer for the role. He also suggested Max von Sydow play Blofeld, and also suggested the actors of M and Q. The Largo Brandauer was the Academy Award winner for a Hungarian film called Mephisto. Irvin Kirshner then handled the ladies. He got uh, Barbara Carrera to play Fatima Blush. Fatima Blush, which was an early name from the original Thunderball scripts. So considering that fact and other Eon productions, uh, borrowed ideas like the Blofeld's cat. It's kind of surprising that the Eon Productions didn't pursue this further. Maybe they were at this point like, whatever. Connery also thought that uh, maybe Felix Leiter should be this time played by a black actor, because apparently he had got the notion that audiences had trouble remembering Felix Leiter, which I find kind of incredible, because Felix Leiter is James Bond. What makes James Bond film stick? Okay, maybe kind of a hyperpole, but... Uh... Uh, extremely a uh, hyperpole. Like, Felix Leiter as a character, he's kind of the white noise 
all of the Bond franchise. Constant white noise in the background. He shows up every now and then to be like, hey, I'm Felix Leiter and here is some info about your mission. And then, well, it's, it's good if he actually manages to show up in the final fight to shoot a gun. Like he, he do, actually does here. A genuine Felix Leiter. Illuminating. Yeah, talking about that late night show where Connery appeared to talk about Never Say Never Again. Uh, the late night host made a very funny joke that... Since Felix Leiter is now played by a black actor, maybe he should instead be called Felix Darker. <laughs> yes. Would definitely not fly on TV today. I like that one. And I guess, I guess I'm the only one who likes it. <laughs> I will not take part in this one. <laughs> yeah, no comment. There was fights on a lack of professionalism, according to Connery, on the set of the film. There were trouble, for example, with the assistant director David Tomlin. There were problems with uh, Schwarzman, the producer, who Connery felt was kind of inexperienced and all these shit shows could have been avoided with a little bit more experience. That's how it usually works, yeah. But um, it seems like Connery is not getting along with a lot of producers, it seems. Anyway, he called the whole Never Say Never Again production kind of a Mickey Mouse operation. At one point, Phyllis Hyman also submitted a title song for this movie, but uh, because Le Grand was responsible for the soundtrack, they couldn't apparently use it. So they were stuck with a slightly lesser tune. Rumor also has it that in the early 90s, Timothy Dalton was asked to play for a sequel to this film. But I haven't heard about that before, so I can't really say anything further. He kinda did. It's known as the next Bond film in the franchise. Which has nothing to do with this shit here. It's still kind of a mystery why we, Sean Connery even bothered with this film. But what you can gather from several sources of Sean Connery's interviews and such, it seems that this is a simple fuck you to Albert Broccoli of Ian Productions. I don't know, the man himself has stated that he just enjoyed the script so much when he was writing. Whatever, and then you do a Thunderball remake. <laughs> well, well, you know, like I said, he enjoyed the script so much when he was writing it. Yeah, I can just see that there was so much bad blood running between Albert or Broccoli, Harry Salzman camp versus Sean Connery that he just decided to do some kind of a lame trick and actually <laughs> make a movie that would piss them off. Of course, the official story goes that after You Only Lit Twice or after Diamonds Are Forever, Sean Connery decided that uh, he doesn't want to be a part of the Ian Productions James Bond franchise because there is less of the essence of what Ian Fleming was writing. More tools, more gadgetry, and that the producers were greedy. Then why did he do this film? Because it's just so not Bond. Well, actually, it, it does make some sense in, in the context of Never Say Never Again, because, like Gary already mentioned, in many ways, the Never Say Never Again, it's, it's a lesser film when you compare it to the Roger Moore films of that same time. Yeah. Like, if you take Connery's viewpoint that that the script simply kept on escalating, getting more wilder and wilder and crazier and crazier and bigger and bigger. And if that would have been a problem for Connery, well, here Connery is once again making a Bond film where the situation and everything to it is 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 toned down. It's it's much smaller in a sense. Kind of still crazy motorcycle chases, crazy explosions. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, but but no one, nobody has a goddamn moon space this time, mm. or, or an underwater city where you try to launch your next super race of human beings. Yeah, like that that is, that is lacking. Like I, I'm not saying that that was necessarily intentional. Like Connery returned to the role because he felt that now we are getting back to the earlier Bond films in a essence, and this is fighting against this these very larger-than-life scenarios of the Roger Moore Bond films. Much more. Ma ma like, ma ma many of the aspects, many Roger Moore. of the situations where the film has been toned down and where, where it's smaller to the Moore films, it, it may, may very well be simply uh, for, for budget reasons. But still, you know, if you take Connery by his word, you can, you can kind of see his... His version of the story rising up when when you compare this one to the other Bond films of the same time. I would have four words for your eyes only. 
very grounded Bond story. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, they started to go with Octopussy a little bit more Octopussy and once again like larger than life stuff a little bit but um, it's one of those John Glenn films so relatively grounded. But no matter how you actually feel about Never Say Never Again and how, how you view it like do you see it as a part of the Bond franchise you still can't actually deny the fact that Connery was involved in the script making so basically what, what you see here is the original James Bond and kind of a, his imagination at play. It it may not be a good point to make for Connery's sake, seeing how the film uh, turned out. But yeah, th- yeah, this is this is Connery at the helm of the story. He tried. He tried. Like we, we are. Tried. We never say never. We are again. We are. We are. We are watching Connery's creative spar. Also interesting what Sean Connery said about uh, Sean Connery and Roger Moore playing their respective, well, playing James Bond. Much more. Uh, Roger Moore. <laughs> Connery said that he plays Bond with the re- reality and credibility and that anything is possible. Whatever that actually means, it kind of makes it sound kind of a fantastical, but uh, this is what he had to say about much more Roger Moore. He said that he plays, uh, Ro- <laughs> he said that he plays James Bond jokey at the expense of everything. And he said that Roger Moore's portrayal is more of a parody of the role. And he didn't, didn't say it in any kind of a ill will. The, uh, Sean Connery and Roger Moore are kind of a good buddy since forever. But yeah, that's what he had to say about the differences between the two actors in the role and uh, that the actors kind of got uh, entirely different audiences for James Bond. I don't know about that, but uh, to a point. Uh, to a point at least. I mean, Connery's Bonds are more serious. E- even this one, is, is more serious than, for example, Moonraker. Yeah. All right! Would it be scene by scene? Yeah. Do we have to? Like, really? Affirmative. If we just, you know, keep bad-mouthing the film here and just jump to the end, end credits. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have a job to do here, and... Uh, opening! The opening is the worst opening in Bond history. I I, I couldn't go quite figure out why, why the background of the opening says... 700, 700, 700. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of that. The title song is oddly addictive and a definite earworm to me, but um, I realize still that it sucks. It, it does try, though. Mm. The, it's extremely bad song, or I, I don't know, extremely maybe once once again hyperbolizing the the issue here, but it it's not a good song. And the chorus is a complete fucking train wreck. <laughs> and go completely un- unlistenable. But uh, amidst the terrible parts, you can actually s- hear the moments where the song tries to be good and tries to tries to be in the same vein <coughs> as as other Bond themes. It's a shit song. Keep dancing. <laughs> there, there, there are, it's a si- shit song that has seconds of goodness in it. I think I think it's a better song than what the lyrics are. They are proper shit. But the the, the lyrics are part of the song. Like, yeah, okay. Let's say that the lyrics are better than the singing or the lyrics in the singing. No, it's so all kinda, shit. Yeah, kind of yeah, because the, because because the lyrics are really really. I I, w- I would even say shameful. It's just like it's just like a pissed up guy in a karaoke bar. <laughs> <laughs> and James Bond looks like he's been found in a bar. <laughs> yes, that he fucking does. With his terrible tattoo, and he looks like he's been on the booze for 35 years. Yeah, the Sean Connery tattoo is already visible there at the rooftop. Yep. What the fuck? So, so to be noted here, there, there are like two eras of Sean Connery. There, there is the dashing young man Sean Connery, and there, then there is the distinguished gentleman Sean Connery. But unfortunately, Never Say Never Again just happens to have the in-between those two Sean Connery, where he simply just looks old and maybe drunk. But at least they make fun of the age factor, unlike in the Roger Moore films. True. True, and that that is one of the highlights of the film, and one of the aspects that I do like, honest to God, do like in the story. Yeah, rumor has it that there was a proper opening sequence shot for this film, which does not feature in the finished film in any way. 
Here we just, you know, start the movie with the titles rolling while we are watching the, well, what is now the opening scene. Well, maybe there were some legal problems with with them taking the original opening sequence. Or it was just a proper shit sequence. But of course there are things like the opening gun barrel that they can't use. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, so Bond is not on the field, but he has been teaching for the last years or so. When people discuss this film, they usually say that Bond has retired, but uh, that is actually not true. Well, it, it, yeah, yeah, not not true and kind of is, because Bond has been off the, off field work. Yeah, and okay, and this uh, stabbish exercise sequence M deduces that James Bond is not fit for work, so he needs a rigid exercise regime to teach more double O agents or something. I don't even know what that's all about, but he's, he's teaching some people, and he gets sent to shrublands where there's a clinic. Have you ever actually wasted your life thinking why Sean Connery actually has the S sound? Because definitely in the earlier films that he has done in Hollywood, he doesn't have it. And okay, you could then counter that by saying, oh, he was just using an American accent or more British accent or whatnot. But that's not the case because you look at all his movies in the early ages, it's not there. Now it's there. Like so did something happen to his jaws or his teeth? Because nowadays it's a zhuzhuz. Don't have any theory on that one. I have no idea. Yeah, I guess he just became the even more gentleman Sean Connery edition. He brings a knife to a gunfight. Like it, it, it might be something like, for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger, where, where the manner of, of speaking has become so iconic that he still uses it. Even though it's not needed, mm. like yeah, like like Schwarzenegger in in real life and all films, Schwarzenegger speaks better English than he does on screen. But because his fan base is so used to that pronunciation of English, he still actually uses it in his films. You think that's the case for Connery? Well, well, it could be. Like that is the first possibility that comes to my mind. And we do get to one of the best Moneypenny scenes, still, in this film, actually, where Bond comes to Moneypenny's office and says, I'm to eliminate all free radicals. Oh, do be careful. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that I'm to eliminate all free radicals line was something that gave, gave Ian Fleming a stiffy back at the day. <laughs> <laughs> Arrival to Shrapland cities, and apparently there's enough for scar tissue for an entire regiment. Connery experimented with hair pieces or without hair piece in this film, and he decided that he looks like Jimmy Stewart without a hair piece. So, and then there's a doctor visit, and <laughs> there you get the the sarcastic James Bond of Sean Connery that we all know and love. And it's uh, pulled to the extremes here, and he pulls it off so well. And you can see that the guy is really enjoying himself. And uh, one of the best performances as James Bond is what you get from the man is right here because he was involved with the production and the script is my theory yeah this is the best script that connery has had in years if you if you take connery's word for it and <sighs> why wouldn't you i don't know about that <sighs> but then there is the lady that wants a urine sample from bond and bond asks if he should suit it from his location uh, we never get an answer maybe we're introduced to fatima blush who goes through several secret gates to enter the headquarters of spectre and uh, we hear Blofeld say that the tears of Allah is now in motion. Fatima Blush is helping in this operation and Lago comes on the video screen via Skype in 1983. Captain Chuck Patachi has been chosen to get the replica eye of the US president. I'm just not so sure what is the point of giving a fake eye and put it into a real eye socket for a guy. like. What's the point? You already have the eye. Do you need to have it in a body? I, I don't know if, if if the implication here was that it is the Petashi's real eye that simply have surgically affected the iris in some way, which is never explained. Well, we are explained that the tobacco smoke somehow makes the eye even worse. Yeah, it's, it's the smoke that makes the eye worse for some reason. Smoking's terrible, but heroin is fine. Absolutely. 
Yeah, heroin does not cause smoke that goes into your eye. Like, sure, sure, the stuff may cause a nerve damage and, for example, affect the blood flow inside your body, which also could be bad for the eye, but you don't have smoke. That's the essential component here. So Bond bumps into a doctor on the alleyway or highway or whatever of this hospital and off they go to a room and... Uh, the doctor is trying to destroy Bond's thoracic vertebrae. <laughs> the humor is actually not bad in this film and in these scenes at the hospital. I don't know what the hell this doctor is doing, but yeah. Then there's the evening surprise when Bond shows his case where you have beluga, caviar, frail's eggs, vodka, etc. Followed by Jack the Eye Ripper, who has been a bad boy and has been smoking. Fight and Zeus with blush. There's a bunch of threats in the air from Blush. Blush says that he must follow orders or his sister might be in danger. I guess it's gonna be an eternal question why even Petachi likes this lady Blush who keeps beating him up. Uh, why is this clinic allowing this eye therapy or whatever the hell it is to happen anyway? Who knows? Probably the same for the same reason that it allows a dominatrix boots on the nurses. <laughs> and Bond sees the navy bag. Now Bond is behind the shutter and makes the shutter go up. I mean, why was he grabbing the shutter? Like, what the hell? Maybe he wanted to troll. Yeah, yeah, the shutter was put down to begin with, and then Bond, for some odd reason, just chooses to mess with it. <laughs> yeah. And blows his cover. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's a thing that happens in this movie, for some goddamn reason. Yeah, it's a script that happens, and... Um... <laughs> The, the script does happen quite a lot here on Never Say Never Again. Yeah, there's quite a lot of exposition here. Yeah, and also, since, since we we have already touched upon the Thunderball, I guess it bears to note that in, in this part of the film, the whole mysterious patient thing is, is extremely prominent. Like, the Shrapnel section of the film leans strongly into the mystery of the patient and tries to emphasize how mysterious the situation is. And the whole thing, in my opinion, was actually put off way better back in Thunderball. Yeah, well, at least in this film, the whole clinic or whatever Shrapland scene is kept shorter than in Thunderball. Yeah. And has more action. But I, I don't know if that is a good thing, because in my opinion, the Shrapland section actually is one of the best sections of the film. That it is, but gotta keep on with the fake Thunderball. Now Bond gives the free chance for Blush to see 007. And oh yes, 007. Yeah, Blush is completely obsessed with the 007 throughout this film. Apparently Bond is making a lot of progress with uh, T. Then we get to the Lippe fight at the gym. And this is one of the best scenes and one of the most stupid scenes of the film. But arguably one of the best. Just like Archop, he really doesn't care about heavy objects hit hitting his stomach. Heavy, Mr. Bond? Yeah. The Lippe fight. Like, medically, what's going on there? At what part? When when Bond picks up the dumbbell and throws it at his stomach, and he doesn't feel anything. Well, he just, you know, tenses his, his muscles. Hmm. Which he doesn't do when he gets a bunch of piss glass in his back and piss in his face. <laughs> well, well, you you don't have easy to tense up muscles in those areas. <laughs> well, but like in your stomach region, the muscles actually are pretty easy to to tense up uh, momentarily. Well, Bond didn't seem to have much of a trouble in tensing his back muscles for the class, but well, well Bond is highly trained double O. Yeah, just like Paddy. Bond hits the glass with his back, but is not injured in any way. Yeah, 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 but with, with the paddy, the glass makes the decision to stab him in the back. Oh, now I get it, now I get it. So Bond got all the breakaway glass in the world, but the bad guy just happened by accident to get the real glass. Yeah, see, the glass has read the script and knows that the movie has to advance. Okay, okay, thank you, gotcha. But in all seriousness, I, I feel that the whole Lippe fight kind of a... In a good way, it showcases, at least on my end, it showcases my biggest problem with, with this film, which is that the 
tone of the movie keeps shifting constantaneously. Does it? Like all the time. It at, at times it is like the beginning of the Lipe fight, where there really is this feeling of dread, and you can kind of feel the threat building around Bond. Like audience knows that the bad guys, the Spectre already knows that Bond is in Shrublands. Bond does not know this, and then you. Then you get those moments when Lipe is approaching Bond and without Bond knowing that Lipe is a Spectre assassin. And also once the fight starts, there are some really good moments I really did enjoy. Like that one moment when they are fist fighting through the hallway and there is a bunch of old people watching the TV program and in the middle of the fight there is that one second. One second when Lipe seizes the fight and simply leans into the chair to showcase the elderly people w- watching the TV program that nothing is going on. Like, well, mm. puts on this fake masquerade for the elderly and then continues with the fight. Once again, a moment that I really did enjoy, but all those moments are kind of surrounded by all this stupidity. Like that one moment where Bond hits Lippe in the nose with the door. Or, or the moment that when was great. It, it wasn't. It, it was stupid as fuck. Like it's the entire fight. And and, and <laughs> so was the moment when when Bond used the broom to trip Lippe over in the stairs. And finally, when Bond literally throws his piece at Lippe's face. <laughs> all stupid moments. All stupid moments. Terrible fight. Stupid section altogether. But there were moments of brilliance. To be fair, Bond didn't know it was his piss until after he threw it. Yeah, I just always felt that Bond and the piss scene, it kind of lacks grace and makes Bond look like a lesser guy. Well, wh- I don't think an English gentleman would be throwing his own piss at his enemies. I-, I guess what they were going at was that it's a really threatening situation and Bond is getting hits and he's, he's getting desperate so he kind of a grasps every straw he can get, and one of those straws just happens to be his piece. Yeah, but all things but, considered, but, the scene where Bond makes Lippe's nose broken with the door, that's one of the best scenes, because it brings the laughs in. It's just kind of embarrassing. Like it's supposed to be, that's what it's trying to do. Well, is it? Is it? Or is it supposed to be embarrassing, or is it supposed to be funny? Because those are two completely <laughs> different things. It's supposed to be embarrassing for the bad guy, and it's a funny scene. But it's embarrassing to watch, and that's the problem. Mm, no. Yep. No, it's fun to watch. You, 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 feel, you feel sorry for the film, you feel sorry for the Bond, and you most definitely feel sorry for yourself because you have to watch it. I kind of agree with Kara here. I thought it was good. Correct. Well, that's, that's only because you come from Britain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, but yeah, but um, how does Carrie like it then? Because he's not from Britain either. Well, generally speaking, I don't like the British uh, comedy TV series as or such. But when British humor is executed right at the right time, it will work. Like here. Oh my God! I I can't believe that you are siding with the hell yeah h- hitting the nose with a door moment. Well, why wouldn't it be funny? It's a big guy who gets hit with a door. I, I, it's a bad guy who gets hit in the nose. May I reiterate, in the a big of a guy. Fight. Yeah, it's a big guy who has been quite, quite threatening until this point, and then the big guy gets hit on his nose with the fucking door. That's why it's funny. It's not embarrassing. It's funny. It just takes all credibility out of the big bad bad guy. Nah. Yeah. Happens sometimes. G- getting getting hit by a door into your nose. In the middle of an assassination attempt, that's that's just that's kind of a first step in a long, long sequence of steps that, in the end, end up you getting peace thrown at your face. Yeah, still funny as hell. No can do. <laughs> but now there is the Jack Petacci's adventure inside a U.S. military base, and he gets into the U.S. president's special section where he can replace the nukes with real nukes. And apparently gives Spectre the ability to control the missiles. I, I don't know if he gave the uh, Spectre the ability to affect the missiles. Because I, I took it that he simply changed the missiles to actually carry a nuclear load. 
Well, that he did, but there still has to be a reason why they can control these nuclear warheads. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, they have a doohickey on the boat where they are. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that's enough. Yeah, they, they Spectre just uses gizmo. And of course, nobody in the operating room gets the message that the fake nuclear warheads have been replaced with the actual warheads. O- of course not. Why, why would you actually inform anyone at the base that someone has just changed your dummy warheads to real one? Yeah, I mean, there could have been at least one more announcement, like... The nuclear weapons have been now replaced with actual nuclear weapons. Have a nice day. But apparently the president of the United States is in control of these announcements. Yeah, just so that if the president so chooses, he can just quietly start the nuclear war. Yep, yep, yep. And may I just point out that the president of the United States has the ugliest eye ever. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he does, yeah. Fatima Blush kills Jack Petacci, goes with a snake through a wall. The warheads are taken into the control of Spectre when they come into a range. There is a Dr. No sound effect used during this scene when they captured them, during the Chang scene. During his fuel elements. Chang, where's Chang? Go back, motherfucker. Hurry. Sorry, I got carried away. And the soundtrack in this film is so bad. Mm-hmm. So bad. It is, it is. It, I, for, for example, in, in the moment where, where Fatima Plush assassinates Petachi, like... It, it, it's supposed to be a serious scene because a person loses his life and the bad guys are tying up the loose ends. But goddamn song in the background just quite makes it comedic at that moment. Yeah, I don't know what this style of music is actually what they're doing here. But uh, as far as I know, the guy who made the soundtrack is a jazz musician. So that's exactly what you're kind of getting right here so i guess i just answered my own question but uh, in this scene this music is coming from a radio so in that sense it's kind of making the scene more you know psychotic that there's this happy go lucky music in the background that was what they were trying to achieve but i i don't feel that it it played off in the end mm-hmm. because i i don't get that psychotic feeling from that moment I mean, Blush is for sure psychotic. Yeah. She's fucking crazy. Total cuckoo. She is, but she's also stupid, and the stupid is what actually shows through with that background music. Actually, gotta wonder if Fatima Blush was close to these explosions for real, because when she kills Jack Petacci and tries to kill James Bond and the girl in the hotel room, she kind of jumps a little bit during those scenes. Or maybe it was just Sean Connery trying to direct into the film some more reality and the credibility. Uh, something that most definitely was right there with the explosions was the ADR, which is slightly off on the moment when Blush retrieves her snake. Oh. It, it's not a big deal, it's just the ADR lags behind a few microseconds. You mean the, oh my baby. Yeah, precisely, that line. Yeah, I can totally see that that kind of line could have been added in an ADR. So now we are in a scene where we are talking about the warheads. Now Spectre is making the demand that 25% of all countries' revenue, like GDP, is supposed to go to Spectre. They are utilizing their terrorism and extortion. And uh, conveniently this 25% turns into 25 billion. <laughs> and a nuke will follow if these orders are not followed. The double O operatives are somehow now put back into business because of this, and uh, Connery is, or Bond is studying Maximilian Largo on his screens for whatever reason. Moneypenny comes to interrupt the moment to say that M has something important to say for him, and so the scene ends. Terrible acting, terrible performance. Also, the logic kind of goes out of the window later on with the film. They're trying to set up a point in the plot here, and oh boy, does that not work. Okay, I guess we'll check that soon, and now Largo arrives to his ship, and then we spend a hell of a lot of time out of the film's running time to see when Largo is greeting his criminal friends on the boat by first name. Hey Jack, hey Joe, hey Emily, I don't get it. And I really, really, really dislike the Largo in this film, Rice. Really? Yeah, this character is just ill all the way through. I thought he was the best actor in the entire film, actually. Mm. 
Well, I'm not commenting on the acting per se. I'm commenting on how the character appears in this film, which is really slimy and sleek. Yeah. Oh, the whole package. Oh. Uh, what? What? Are, are you trying to say that you have a problem with the fact that Largo is is essentially he's threatening the whole world with, with nuclear missiles and still manages to take a break to play a peeping tom? Yeah, that's one aspect and. Just being creepy and appearing everywhere suddenly, playing piano. Dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, it just strikes me as a very cuntish person, always lying and faking himself. I think he's kind of sarcastic too. Mm. But I mean, every villain in the Bond franchise has to be a cunt. Uh, that it is, so they're a job well done. He succeeds in being unlikable, which I guess is what the baddie should be. Then we get to the M briefing and somebody has the great idea that the subterranean explosion would be the worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah, maybe, okay, so what? Where are you pulling this from? Why are you mentioning it? <laughs> okay. I guess it's because the oil lines are going right there, but I mean, like, uh, who's talking about oil pipes at this point? <laughs> Whatever. M thinks that it's highly implausible that there would be a fake guy in play. My eye agrees. It kind of is, but then again, M fails to take notice the fact that he's in a Bond film. This is not a Bond film. <laughs> Exercise session. Yeah, to get back to the piano scene, it seems that the yoga or whatever instructor gets a little bit pissed off that the Largo has suddenly appeared. Looks like they were having something deeper going on there. Hmm. Yeah. Then Largo hands the amulet for Domino and uh, makes the point about the amulet that, like all great legends this is also true that allah was crying so hard that it made an actual river yeah and, and he gives her the necklace which is the most expensive thing in his collection and it looks like a cheap piece of plastic that you just got from the nickel store <laughs> yeah i guess he was making a reference with the amulet that it's kind of referencing the operation that is the most expensive thing that he has ever ran which is kind of disturbing if it's coming from a cheap nickel store. Now Domino asks from Largo what would happen if she would ever leave him. No, really? Then I'll cut your throat. Bye-bye. Um, that's the first sign of him being a cunt. Yeah. That's a real cunt thing to do. Yeah, with that delivery you can only take it literally. And there's the hand again, right? Largo likes to be waving in several directions. Like, bye-bye. I also hated that. Bye bye you. Bye bye you. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Q sin. Q is called Algernon or something like that. Yeah, I, I guess they couldn't use the name Q. Mm. Was it also copyrighted? Didn't they use the name Q? They, they use, and then they reference him as Algernon yep. for some odd reason. Yep. It looks like it's his name this time around. Plain and simple. Okay, we have a pen with which you can write really binding agreements indeed. This movie has quite a lot of good humor, actually. There made Q actually kind of the antithesis for the Eon Productions Q. He actually likes the chaos that Bond is producing and wants to get up, get himself to the field as well to have a bite of the sex, drugs and rock and roll. I hope you are going to have some gratuitous sex and violence. Yeah, I kind of like the Q here more than in the official canon because i i felt that q being kind of a not so patriotic and not so nationalistic entity and to be more more of this disgruntled office worker who feels that the next door company is offering better benefits to its workers and who laments on the cuts on his operation budget it, it kind of gave him more personality than in the Eon productions. Yeah, I kind of liked that the Q was his kind of own character and kind of liked him in his own way. Then we are introduced to Rowan Atkinson in his first feature film. Ooh. Mr. Bean is the assistant of the Secret Service. Yeah. And I'm saying that only because he is being very much a Mr. Bean in this scene. It's kind of a cool thought. You know, he was... Rowan it's Atkinson not starting in Johnny English. It's awesome. Screaming Mr. Bond all over the island. And uh, then this line from Bond. I'm sure he's very kind to his mother. Don't know his mother. And uh, take full advantage of the natural cover. 
and then hides behind the pillar. Yeah, I, I was, I, I've never been able to understand what the hell actually Robin Atkinson is doing here in, in this film. And, well, and well, once again, this to me, this showcases the problem with the shifting tone that happens constantly and with Never Say Never Again. Because this is, for, this scene follows quite closely to the previous scene, the, the Q scene, which also was funny, but was way more serious than, than Atkinson showing up here. I think this film is consistently stupid with its characters throughout. It is, it is consistently stupid, but it does have attempts at seriousness. And it, it does have a few great ideas every here and there. Mm, didn't bother me. Actually, this uh, small faucet scene was one of my favorites, absolutely, from this film. I, I most definitely hated it. You just can't help loving the humor there when the Mr. Bean, Mr. Small Fawcett, takes advantage of the natural cover and then James Bond turns around and makes his face like, oh my god, I can't believe this guy. I, 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 it's hilarious. I, on my end, I despise everything in this scene. I, I despise how Atkinson looks, I despise how he speaks, Really? I despise Bond's reactions, and I despise the failed attempts at comedy. Are you fucking kidding me in this yeah. podcast? No, I'm being yeah. I, I'm being 100% serious here. Unlike this fucking film. I liked it. Yeah, it was... Go to hell! It's... It's... It's doing exactly what it's supposed to be and succeeds 100%. Which is... Which is shooting the tone of the film... To the kneecaps. That's the, what it actually is doing here. Like it does throughout the film, so no I, problem. I, I, I can, I can understand Tom liking this scene because it has Ravan Atkinson in it, and Ravan Atkinson is one of the national treasures of British Empire. But Curry, for fuck's sake, what is your excuse? Well, uh, what do you mean, my excuse? Like the film's best top-notch jokes are right here, the chemistry <laughs> no, plays no, well no, together, no, it's, and, and the way that Small Fawcett it ma- is made to look in this scene, it's like brilliant, pure gold. It, it, it's kind, kind of a, a, a drunken turkey that has been run over. Like, that is the look <laughs> wow. that Atkinson wow. has here. I think it's but just I mean, Rowan Atkinson, but with uh, interesting suit here. As Kyrie says, the Roger Moore films, more, much more, are very humorous too. Yeah. And don't have that kind of serious tone to them. Yeah, so what's different here? It's just yeah. brought back to the yeah. Diamonds Are Forever type of exactly. slapstick. Yeah. In in here I see honest to God desperation on the film's behalf to try to make a joke. Are you kidding me? Like we got the same type of humor with M, we got it with Q and now we get it with small faucet. So what's the problem? We we got it with Q. That much I'm I'm willing to admit. When it came to M, I r- didn't like what the film was trying to do with M, which is k- k- kind of a have this whole oh look how the establishment is full of liberal cocks who drink soy attempt going on it. I I felt that was misplaced. No. And poorly handled. No, your analysis is misplayed here. M is played here in the way that it's kind of an office clerk who has no clue how things actually work in the field. Yeah. M is your office pencil neck beta. That's what M is here. In ne- Never Say Never Again. And I really don't feel like that that is a comparison you should actually draw in a Bond film. Because if you, if you take that tone, if you, if you go and you say that the the establishment and the bureaucracy and, and and basically the one person in the franchise who you constantly show up being a limiting force and kind of a being the stops for Bond, not go completely over the edge with these free roaming antics. Using rampant violence and explosions to get to your means. If you take that character and you make it this stupid out of the loop has no grasp at re- reality figure in that case you kind of go and make the statement that we should kind of be at all at bond and and this constant usage of violence to 
to de- get you through what in the end are very politically loaded situations. Uh, I, I'm sorry, what? I was checking out the Rowan Atkinson scene muted and I was already laughing my ass off. <laughs> You 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 can you can take your Rowan Atkinson scene and you can go to hell, man. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you are fucking joking in the background. <coughs> <coughs> Fuck. Are you okay? <coughs> we we are hearing the magic of the Rowan Atkinson scene here. <coughs> it's it's Gary gasping gasping at air. <coughs> 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 No, seriously, man, are you okay? The, the rhetoric in this podcast is just getting wilder and wilder. It's cutting edge. It's cutting edge material from the flick lab. And then there is Fatima on water skis. Great line, too. How reckless of me. Now I made you all wet. Yeah, well, my martini is still dry. Best line in the film. Probably, yeah. Uh, that it's is the best that, line. That is, the that is a funny line. It, it, it's a good joke. I give it that much. Yeah, I never usually laugh out loud during watching Bond films, but happened here. Flush and Bond go swimming, but uh, Flush flushes herself out of the situation and leaves Bond with a creepy shark that uh, has an antenna on top of it. Like, wh- why? Why do you have an antenna on top of a shark? Yeah, Spectre is radio controlling shark. Well, apparently. Because that's the only plausible explanation. I first thought that it was some kind of a film crew tool that they were using to locate their sharks in a super big pool or something. But the shark scenes are actually really good. You know, there's some serious, real close contact with the sharks. Even more so than, I would say, in Thunderball. Like, there's not a lot of heavy editing going on there. And cuts like, yeah, they are really right there. Uh, Well, yeah, granted, for Connery it was kind of... Too much right there during the filming of Thunderball as well. But anyway, Bond is being <laughs> fetched by the girl. And then Fatima notices that, oh, this bugger is still alive. Now with this super overly confident face, Fatima Blush blows up the wrong hotel room. Like, why, why didn't you check first? This is so dumb. It is, it is. And the music in the lobby really pisses me off. I kind of get the feeling that you have very mixed feelings about this film. No. I kind of have. Totally and stylistically, I think this film is uh, far inferior to the Ian Productions any film. But if I would have to raise something in specific, like, yeah, the soundtrack is a bummer. It really drags this film down. And that's rare. Perhaps it's uh, also way too contemporary for its own good. It sounds really dated, as well as sounding awful. But nevertheless, whatever the film throws at you, keep dancing. Keep dancing. Small faucet calls just before the explosion in the hotel, Mr. Bond! And uh, gives the exposition that, yeah, Largo has gone to south of France, whatever that means. And then Bond and the girl arrive to the south of France, the famous south of France airport. And then the agent 326, the woman named, named after a hotel room, apparently. <clears throat> apologizes her lack of experience, which I didn't like. Why can't you have like an equal to a Bond type of agent? You just can't because it's a woman. Then there is the deducement that uh, it's too unlikely that the bombs would be aboard the ship. I thought this could be a kind of a job at Thunderball because they they, they definitely are held aboard Disco Volante. But then again, (laughs) here Largo keeps keeps the bombs on his small boat. Uh, Actually, any of you guys know why are MI6 and Bond interested in Largo? They are interested because... Because he's a rich businessman. And that kind of is the, is the only excuse that you could possibly throw at the situation. I mean, we know that uh, they are interested about Jack Petacci who died, but then how do they make the connection to Largo? Precisely, because even Fatima Plush's identity and involvement in the situation is not currently known by NATO, nor MI6, and from the Spectre's end, Blofeld has been the only one to actually make a connection, or, or make a contact to NATO, and this way kind of a show himself. And even Blofeld disguised his identity during the video phone call he made. So, oh, how yeah. exactly is, is Bond 
suspicious of Largo, who hasn't shown up anywhere in the film except in, in that one meeting amongst the Spectrum members. I guess it has something to do with the fact that Jack Petacci died and then the uh, the sister of Jack Petacci is Domino, Domino Petacci! And somehow, by a random accident, they managed to see Domino Petacci dancing on the deck of Largo's ship, so obviously he's the bad guy. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. <laughs> now that you mentioned that connection, that sort could of. be what Bond is chasing after that. Well, pretty ham-fisted idea. No, well, not nearly as ham-fisted as, as the movie made it out when it simply jumped into this, that scene where Bond is checking up Largo on the computer archives for no apparent reason. Spa reception. Bond finds out that they serve, of course, men as well. Some men more than others. Jesus. And this, and this is the creepiest moment possibly in the entire <laughs> Bond franchise. It not, is, it is. Not, 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 not a Bond film. Not part of the franchise. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I have to correct you there. But, but this nowadays, well, and even back then, could be seen as sexual assault. I know, and she just yep. smiles it away. Well, actually, even Kim Basinger herself, who, who plays a domino in the film, makes this really odd face after Creeper Bond leaves her. Yeah, the crux here is supposed to be that uh, Bond is trying to get to the very restricted guest list of the charity event that Largo is hosting later tonight. Domino the girl doesn't know what Cela V means. Like, th this is silly, like, okay, it's making Bond once again the more educated one. This massage feels so good. It certainly does. What? Yeah, fucking Creeper Bond. <laughs> Old Creeper. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sean Connery looking so old actually makes no favors to this scene. And neither does the fact that Connery's tattoo is showing. Can we just start reviewing Octopussy from this moment onwards? <laughs> I mean, it's a much better film. Yeah, and that, that, that is and that is a film where a woman is referenced as Octopussy. Yeah, even then. Yeah. If I walked into a massage parlor and pretended to be a masseuse, and then I proceeded to lay my hands on a woman and massage her. That, I would be arrested. It's that fucking bad. But you don't have the <laughs> charm of Sean Connery, so... I, I do. He will get excused. Oh. Yep. Well, oh. Okay, oh, so maybe in that case. The agent 326 says she is going to a villa, and then Blush orders to find that villa. Receptionist gets the fake cigarette holder bomb. He never screams for help. Maybe it has a voice detection too. We just don't know about that. Then Connery finds Kim Basinger in the party and uh, asks if she wants a hard or soft, soft drink. And uh, yeah, Jesus. The joke from the massage repeats. Largo makes the notion to blush that uh, maybe there will be a day when you will get to kill Domino as well. Largo doesn't like the idea clearly at this moment, but Blush is very turned on by the idea. Blush is like the 80s version of Xenia Onatop, right? Oh yes, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and we get to play the Domination, which is about uh, fighting for a country, selected randomly by the machine. Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. This is fucking retarded. It is, it is, it is the most retarded shit in the, that I've seen with a movie that tries to present you a goddamn video game. Like, it, it, Domination does have state-of-the-art graphics, but, but when, when you look at how, how they play the game, it tells you immediately that the gameplay is utter shit. Okay, I didn't get that from the film, but I certainly couldn't figure out how to play it. You, you, are, you are shooting the tiles with pew-pews. I guess, but it's really hard to follow what happens there. Like, like, like I said, the gameplay is shit. I mean, to, 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 to kind of give you an image how I feel about Domination, Domination is a game that makes even Shenmue look playable. You're not bringing Shenmue back to this podcast. <laughs> Greatest game ever made. <laughs> take, take it away, Kari. Oh, uh, no, thanks. <laughs> You're just dead wrong. I mean, I'm sorry, guys, but... This film is so bad, and it was so hard to watch, but I find it hard to give any kind of philosophical, eloquent points, because I can't find any. But 
Okay, I will go back a little bit to Shenmue. <laughs> just to talk about the uh, cutscenes. But yeah, Largo loses the game. Then there's the dance with Domino. Tells the Domino that brother was used and, and then eliminated. <laughs> Keep dancing. Meanwhile, Fatima Blush is preparing to kill both of them and has gotten the green light from Largo for that. And he's stepping the steps down and... Bah, 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 bah. Are these the nuttiest villains that you have ever had in a Bond film? Kinda, yeah. Like, this, is the, this isn't the first time, nor is it the last time when we have seen crazy and psychotic villains in Bond films. But these ones are most definitely, like you said, nutty. Yeah, and frankly the least likable. Now Bond is munching on an apple. I feel that these sets are kind of rough around the edges, and especially this location feels dirty. You know, Lago kind of looks like Julian Assange. Okay. Mm. I'm kind just of. saying. Yeah, yeah. He, he does. And now Bond is changing for Fatima Plage after she has killed the Agent 326. A motorcycle chase ensues. Fatima is completely obsessed about Bond. Don't touch him, he's mine. Bond gets momentarily inside a truck where he stays about five seconds and then gets out. Then we get to the interesting lines at the end. Well, in view of your hatred of men. Liar! Well, to be perfectly honest, there was this girl in Philadelphia. Shut up! Oh. Just remembered, it's against the service policy for agents to give out endorsements. <laughs> yeah, I I never actually got why why in the hell Fatima was so hung up on getting Bond to sign up on a dirty piece of paper that she was a good screw. Because she's such a narcissist. Yeah, because she's crazy. Because it's produced by Kevin McClory. And also we see the appearance of the worst weapon in the Bond franchise. I mean, how long did it take for that pen to explode? Fucking forever. Yeah. Even w when it was finally firing off, or the explosive charge was was starting to explode, it, it started to shoot sparks for some goddamn reason, which is obvious giveaway that whatever was sh just shot out of the pen is dangerous and it started to harm you. I mean, not only is this the worst Bond film, but I think it's one of the worst films. Ever. I, I don't know if it's, it's if it's one of the worst films ever, because I, I've seen some proper shit films and I, I would say this is better than some of those, but it's it's pretty damn lackluster. Yeah, it's kind of hard to give any great insight, you know, for the listeners, because the film was so boring and I, I just kind of was paying like a quarter of my total attention span. I, I had the same experience. But there's also the fact that the film actually doesn't deal with anything that would give you an interesting discussion point. Yeah, true. Like that, this is a movie that that doesn't really try to say anything or doesn't really try to make any point about well anything in any way. If you don't count in the M plotline or M M being this stuck up office clerk who disapproves Bond's more, well, I, I don't know, wild antics. And then Felix joins the party, but then Bond, fe uh, Bond leaves Felix behind. <laughs> like, what was this? Like, is it just that Bond wants to be the only one that will be carrying on the mission for Her Majesty's government? I, I guess it was simply just the essence of Bond films, making sure that Felix doesn't become more prominent character. Now we're on the ship and Bond sees on the ship when he's strolling around the text Tears of Allah. And then Domino tells about a Palmyra house in North Africa. Very specific once again. Now Bond kisses Domino and this aggravates Largo who is watching behind the glass. Then goes to, I don't know, axe them to death, but they're not there anymore. And it seems like <laughs> Largo notices that Bond just might be behind the glass now. And he is. M gets a signal from Bond about this uh, very specific location of North Africa. The producers wanted to cut some of the Largo scenes out of the film. Like, for example, this Largo and Domino wedding present scene seems like one of those scenes that you could cut out very, very easily. Yeah, that's... The, the, the wedding present scene is kind of easy to sacrifice from the film. The, the, again, if, if you are looking at scenes that most definitely should be removed from the film altogether. 
to make it not so troubling to watch would be the... You're not going to cut small faucet. Not not small faucet, but the whole selling a lady to a bunch of dirty smelling Arabs scene, maybe. Yeah. Especially if you're making a film, kinda, in, in a franchise that has a reputation with a problematic presentation of women. <laughs> yeah, now we have a problematic representation of North Africans, because well, <laughs> the only yeah. North Africans that we see are, of course, perverts. Of course, and and of course they are like like if if they are interested in buying something, anything at all, the most asked for commodity would be a white woman. Palmyra is in Syria, right? But so, yep. but they're talking about North Africa, which Syria isn't. <laughs> nice groundbreaking facts here at the Flick Lab, as always. Bond and Domino are now tied up and Largo is willing to tell the location of the first bomb which is under the president's feet and second bomb he's not willing to tell. <laughs> but it's easy to locate because Largo is a dummy and uh, has given a clue for Domino. It's in the necklace. The dialogue is once again really weird here. You were a really good secret agent. Bye. Once again, the bye. Bye. <laughs> Meanwhile, Domino is being auctioned for some kind of a North African terrorist perverts or whatever the hell is going on here. Meanwhile... Largo is leaving the premises with the small boat and there was something on the boat which uh, I guess is one of the nukes. That's kind of the only way to rationalize what that is. I, I took it also that it was supposed to be the second nuke. Yeah. <clears throat> because that, that that is something that you want lying around with you. Every day. On your motorboat. Because why not? Now Bond and Domino jump off the fortress with a horse that was actually making the jump, like humane treatment of animals. Oh shit! I I, I didn't know that. It I, I was I was looking at it and it it did look surprisingly mm. real because it is. I, I I would say alarmingly so, but I was still hoping that it was just you know clever use of camera tricks. Unfortunately for reals. Fuck you, film. Horse must be traumatized at this moment. Yeah. Still. Still what? Still alive? No, he's still traumatized. Horses live for only like 30 years, right? According to Google, horses live 25 to 30 years. Yeah, so the horse has been taken out of its misery by the concept of life. Bond and Domino get into a sub, and the terrorist perverts have been shot by the submarine, so yeah, hey. And the first nuke has been defused, says M. Well, it's time for some more underwater action, bloop bloop, and Bond happens to know something about some kind of a XT-7B, which is a hovercraft, and with that they get to the rocks. This film is really trying to get the lawsuit from E.ON for the hovercraft. Yup. So apparently, I don't know, now they want to blow up the second bomb because reasons. And uh, now we are at the underwater lair where Largo is doing his silly stuff. Largo takes one of the nukes that is still left, he escapes, there's explosions. Why does Largo put his goggles back on when they have been already removed and they are full of water? <laughs> what the hell? I, I, I didn't understand that. And also, I didn't understand the notion that Largo made made when he... Took a mouthful of seawater that he can't swallow and made the comment oh. sweet like money. And I was like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, this film is filled with kind of really awkward lines for some yep. reason. Sweet like money. What does that even mean? <laughs> sweet like money. <laughs> it makes no fucking sense. And just like in the Eon Thunderball film, here Domino kills Largo, only now underwater. Appears... Completely yeah. out of nowhere. And why? Why Why is Domino there? She's so obsessed about killing Largo. She's also a civilian, so anyone in the sub shouldn't have actually <laughs> have led her to join the fight. So, the end scene. Small Fawcett comes to inform Bond that the fate of the civilized world is in the hands of James Bond. But in Bond's size, the perfect moment to retire is now for Domino. And that's the film. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Henrik, favorite performance. I'm kind of a mixed when it comes to the favorite performance. None of the performances were in any way groundbreakingly good, 
but they were kind of performances that were better than some others. I don't know, if, if, if you take this one sure. first, and I try to make my mind between, between three actors. Well, overall, Connery, at least in his Bond performances, has been very out of balance. Like, for example, in Diamonds Are Forever, he gave a really, really lackluster sleepwalking performance. Perhaps you could argue that also in You Only Live Twice. Here he is clearly enjoying himself and giving a great performance. So I'm just going to go with him. Yeah. For me, it would have to be Largo. I found him really, really good. And it's actually one of the only great things about this film is his acting. For me, it's one of the main reasons to not watch this film. Oh. I mean, the performance is fine. I just hate the character. Yeah, Cla- Klaus actually manages to make the bad guy work here. Yeah. It's another question, do you like the bad guy? Yeah. Like, for example, Curry found him way too creepy and way too annoying. Yeah. But if you take it as such that that was supposed to be the character, Klaus manages to pull it off. Yeah, with sweet salt water. Yeah, with, 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 with something that tastes like money. But doesn't every bad guy have to have a trace of cuntishness? Yep, yep, for sure. By their very nature. Yeah, yeah I just feel this is... Uh, I much prefer something like Hugo Drax, cucumber sandwich. Afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, with with Argo's case, there is no that there is no that uh, dashing cuntishness. You you have more more creepier and more slimier cunt here. Yeah, like mentioned, lacks the gentlemanish quality that the Bond villains usually have. It's a different type of cunt, you know. And that that it is, and that that is why I'm actually I do find myself defending Largo here. But I I can I can very much see Kari's point why why this kind of cunt does not appeal to Kari. Mm. <laughs> Once again, I'm not commenting on the acting. Favorite scene, Henrik. Um, uh, that would be Q's workshop. Hands down, the best scene in the film. Gratuitous sex and violence. I guess I would personally gravitate towards the small faucet introduction. <laughs> I quite like the scene in M's office at the beginning. Okay. Favorite Three quote. radicals. Favorite quote. Oh, it would have to be, but my martini is still dry. All right, then I will go with, I just remembered, it's against service policy for agents to give out endorsements. And I will continue with Q's workshop scene. Now that you are here, I hope we are going to have some gratuitous sex and violence. <laughs> Favorite kill, Henrik. That would be an... This may come as a surprise. This kind of is not kill. The kill happens off screen. Oh. But it's Nicole getting mouthful of waterbed. Oh, I was about to guess that one. Yep. There, there is like... It, it's not a good kill. You don't even see the kill. You just find the body. But there is that one shot of, of Nicole from, from underneath her. Like the camera switches quickly for one second so, so that... It shows you the viewpoint from the waterbed's point of view. You see Nicole lying there in the water and you see Bond on the background. And the, the soundtrack comes in. And I, I from that moment I got this kind of a Miami Vice type of feeling. This, this damp heat in that one shot. And I really did like that one. Okay, I will surprise absolutely no one and go with Fatima Blush exploding. Oh, you took my answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my answer. I guess we'll have to share that one. Sheer kind of retardedness. I mean, between the time that Bond shot the pen and Fatima's death, she could have easily killed him because it took so damn long to explode. Yup. Did you actually figure out, or was it even mentioned, that what the hell Largo is doing in that base with that bomb? Because, uh, I mean, are they just transferring it, or are they about to explode it now? Because the first bomb was found. Uh, anyway, are you happy that this is the film, the swan song of the Sean Connery James Bond era? It's kind of a sad film to end on, if you want my opinion. Yep. Yeah. It's a never say never again, but I'm afraid I will never watch this film again. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, actually, this wasn't the last time that uh, Sean Connery apparently played James Bond, because uh, in 1997 he recorded... a. Uh, Happy birthday video for his actor friend. I memory fails who it was, but 
played Bond there for like a couple of minutes or seconds, and I suppose nobody else has it, seen it than Birthday Boy and his friends. First image that comes to mind. It's Fatima Plush exploding. Uh, the motorcycle chase in general. Again, you kind of sort of stole my answer. I mean, Bond wearing a helmet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. That just kind of comes into my head again and again and again. All right, safety first. Yep. James Bond doesn't have any problems, for instance, in Moonraker, jumping out of a plane, <laughs> and yet he wears a helmet. Which image best exemplifies this film? Uh, I suppose the wing at the end of the film. I, I would say Bond throwing the piece at your face. <laughs> <laughs> would you put yeah. that on a poster? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tom? Uh, I have no idea. Um, come back to me. <laughs> Henrik, what took you out of Never Say Never Again? <laughs> There's so many stupid moments that this film has. Like, I, with this film, I kind of constantly dropped out of it. I, I did find some snippets of things I like, and they lasted for a few seconds, and then it was back to face palming. Uh, the bad acting... Weird lines. Creepy Largo. Tom? Do I have to give just one answer? No. Oh. Well, I could think of 25 different things, but... Go ahead. Um, it's, it's just not a Bond film. It's just not a Bond character. Yeah, why is it not a Bond film, Tom? Because, because he has a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the clamor, the tone is missing... Even the cinematography, I think, is kind of off. Yeah, even though it was praised by somebody, but I'm really not finding it here. They they do they do attempt it, but they don't have enough skill to pull it off. I don't know about skill, really. There's uh, so many members from the Raiders of the Lost Lost Ark team, but somehow seems they couldn't quite pull it off. Yeah, and I I, I kind of can't understand why not. Yeah, because because there there, there are no moments so like. In the beginning of the dance scene, when they're standing still and this glamorous feeling kind of oozing off the screen towards the viewer, but it just doesn't work for some reason. And I, I don't know if, if the reason for that actually is that, that, like you have pointed out, many of the sets look dirty, like the dance floor they are on looks dirty. Like, if, if that's the reason why it just just hmm. doesn't work. It comes off kind of like yesterday's breakfast when it's still stuck in your teeth. Oh, nice. And also quite laughable, to be honest. Tom, did you have any additional bad things to mention about the film? Ugh. Kind of the plot as well. It's just so... It's just not entertaining. Yeah, and it's a Thunderball rehash after all. I was clock watching after the first five minutes. <laughs> what put you in, Henrik? The opening exercise, I did quite like the the way how the film opened. I, I don't exactly know why, because even the exercise is a bit of bullshit, but I guess the factor is that as long as you don't know that it's it's a training mission and it's not a real situation, you, you see Bond going around the premises without his gadgets and you see bad guys with machine guns and th there is some tension in that. What pulled me in, though, kind of everything at the clinic, there's some good humor thrown around there. Piss as well. Yeah. <laughs> what pulled you in? Piss. <laughs> <laughs> Scissors of sacrilege. I, I, I would just can the film, and, and then I would burn the can. And then I would take the ashes and dose them in acid. Yeah, I'm relieved that this episode didn't become a Never Say Never Again versus Octopussy discussion. Can we at least, Henrik, agree that the Octopussy is the better film? It, it, it is. It has done. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not biggest fan of Octopussy. I'm not biggest fan of Roger Moore Bond films altogether. But when compared to this nonsense, you know, Oct Octopussy beats this film out of the park. Right. And then it drives these films home. And beats this film's mom also. So the question is, which film is better, On Her Majesty's Secret Service or Never Say Never Again? Majesty's, of course. Yeah, Secret Service. Yay. And I thought you couldn't get a better film than, than On Her Majesty's Secret Service, but it turns out that it's possible, and it's this film. 
batter? Is that an actual adjective? If it wasn't, then I've just made it one. But there you see, Tom. Never say never. Batter, batter. Yes, it's also sacrilege. I just don't understand why this film exists even today. Like, it's it's a rehash of Thunderball, which wasn't a really that amazing James Bond adventure to begin with. And I think it, this film, Never Say Never Again, is just a ego trip for Kevin McClory and Sean Connery. This film is absolutely pointless. Tom, what would you change in the film? Mm. Just just burn the film. No, I, I would change the soundtrack, okay? Yeah, like, <laughs> that's a fair point. I think that's a pretty good answer, okay? Yeah, the soundtrack doesn't seem to even fit the mood of the scenes. It, it kind of lacks meaning. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's there simply because it's a film, and films have to have soundtrack, so here's some fucking noises at you. I heard a rumor that they actually wanted to do a new version of this film for a 1984 home video release where they would have changed the soundtrack, but um, who knows, and who cares. Henrik, you really know you're watching Never <laughs> Say Never. <laughs> You really know you're watching Never Say Never Again when you next time see a white woman and you immediately go 50 bucks offered going once, going twice. You really know you're watching Never Say Never Again when you just have to keep dancing. (laughs) Whatever the film throws at you, just keep dancing. You know you're watching Never Say Never Again when you have a glass of piss thrown in your face. (laughs) I I, I knew that the, the piss was going to make a comeback here. (laughs) <laughs> this is this is how childish I am. <laughs> but it's an accurate description. Henrik, three adjectives. For me, it's stupid, it's peace-taking, and it's pointless. Tom? I would use the adjectives I used with Her Majesty's Secret Service. It's retarded, <laughs> it's shit, and it's boring. I would go with stupid, pointless, and awkward. I don't think we're going to be on the director's Christmas card list for this year. (laughs) Well, no, because the director is also dead, so no need. But but we may may still manage to gain a shout-out from Connery. Which I don't think will happen now, you know. (laughs) Hey, come on, let me have my dreams. Or if we do get one, it will be, fuck you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Sean Connery getting insulted by the Flick Lab, yay. (laughs) Watch test. Did you look at your watch when you were watching this film? I did it. Yes, yes, I did. I, I, yeah, I surprisingly, I didn't check out my watch. It, it may be because I was too busy facepalming, but whatever the reason, I didn't check my watch. I actually saw it as a plus for the film that it has less underwater sequences than Thunderball. <laughs> but in in Thunderball, the underwater sequences were actually like suspenseful and exciting. Kinda, but the scenes go way too long and it gets a little bit dull. They're having fun with this new fancy technology where you can shoot underwater. Yeah, but but you have a massive underwater fight. Yeah, which is kind of hard to follow, but uh, it's a scene where just stuff happens. Yeah. Uh, that th- that it does. It, 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 you, you don't get a, any kind of a picture on who kills who. But you have a ton of guys who are fighting underwater. Yeah, and in Thunderball, some humane animal treatment, I would say, as well, because they seem to be shooting a real shark. I'm, I'm not gonna comment on that one. Henrik, would you recommend never, never say never? I, I, I would have to say that I would never recommend never say never again. Like, for this episode, I, I had to watch this film twice. Oh my god. And <laughs> at this point, the like, during this recording, we have once again played the film. That is the third time during this week I have seen this film. And I must say, I am tired and I'm fucking done. <laughs> I'm done with this movie. I And and surprisingly, with this movie, as, as baffling and as unbelievable it may sound, I'm also kind of a done with, with Connery as, as Bond. So when it comes to the question that what, what should... Sean Connery do in relationship to Bond franchise. Uh, fuck it, I won't leave. Maybe you would like to join me playing Shenmue 2 instead, because, yeah, I found it a real chore to interrupt my Shenmue 2 playing to watch this f- film. <laughs> I watched it like uh, one and a half times, took my notes, didn't really stop to even 
take additional notes, I just really let it roll and was rolling my notes on real time. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend this film, in case you're wondering. Tom. Hello. Hello. Yep. Still here. Yes, I am. Would you recommend Never Say Never Again? Yes, I would. Okay. Fuck you! Excuse him, what? And I can explain why. I, 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 I guess you didn't hear the question. It was, would you recommend? <laughs> yes, I damn well would. Because it's an example. It's a good example of how not to make a film. <laughs> And media students all over the world need to see this film. I would almost make the case that that the mistakes of the film are too obscure that it w- this would work even as a teaching material on how not to make a film. Just to clear it up for the audience, because you took the special route in recommending the film. What you did you like the film? <laughs> in case anyone is wondering. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to say that if we have any young directors watching or listening, it's highly unlikely. But if there are any, watch this film and do the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't remake Thunderball. <laughs> and, 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 and if if Sean Connery comes to you with the notion that I have made this really great script and I would like you to read it, take the script and burn it. Time to fuck off. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sean, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> If you want another prime example on how to not do a film, go watch uh, Harold Becker's Domestic Disturbance, starring John John Travolta. Anything to add, or should we get the hell out of the laboratory? I mean, watching that film was just a torturous experience. It was like I was being nailed to a cross. Was it that bad? (laughs) Like, of course, it was bad, but uh, there's some good humor, at least, sometimes. Actually, thinking about it, I kind of felt like I had to laugh at the piss scene. I felt like I had to laugh. This film is literally throwing the piss. I think the director is taking the piss, as we say in England. (laughs) Right. Eric, how's your Shenmue? Go back to play it. Fuck no. You can can keep your deceased quick-time event gameplay. All right. That was the Connery run of this Bond marathon for now. We have covered Connery, Lazenby, and more. Much more. Roger Moore. You see, there still was a way to get the stupid joke to this episode. I I, I, I kind of hate you guys. <laughs> Afternoon tea. Cucumber sandwich. Keep dancing. <laughs> Keep dancing, dear listeners, whatever films throw at you. When it comes to the James Bond challenge in this podcast, we will next cover... Dalton. Timothy Dalton. Finally. <laughs> yes! The living daylights. Uh, it's, it's been a long hike to get to Dalton. I think everybody's looking forward to this change. Yes. So It's kind of breathing new life into our little marathon. True that. After two rehashes back to back, never say never again a Moonraker, we can take something else. Hey, hey. So regarding Bond Challenge, uh, join us uh, next month for The Living Daylights in the Gibraltar Rocks. Regarding next week, I hope it will be Mali and Yelen. Until next week. Stay tuned next month for more, much more. Timothy Dalton. Uh, that, <laughs> that didn't rhyme. Dalton. Do. Oh god, I'm happy to finally be free of this one. Where did you find it? Ah, the local library. Because I sure as shit wasn't going to buy this to my own collection.